Today is number two in our series on a change of priesthood, and yesterday we talked about Melchizedek. Today we're going to mention the first time the tithe is ever mentioned as Abraham gave to Melchizedek tithes of all. I know it was back there, but is it still for today? We're going to find out that from the Word of God. Open up your hearts, open up your Bibles, and let's be blessed together. For more than 40 years, Bob Yandian has been an expositor of the Bible, making seemingly complicated doctrine easy to understand. Grab your Bible and study the Word of God with Pastor Bob Yandian. Hello and welcome again to Student of the Word with Pastor Bob Yandian. Glad to have you here today. We began a two-day series yesterday on the changing of the priesthood from the Old Testament to the New Testament. We often think, well, that just means, you know, from the time of, of Moses and we had, you know, Aaron in that priesthood to the priesthood of Jesus Christ. And actually, to be honest with you, Jesus Christ picked up a priesthood from before the time of the law, and he picked up the order of Melchizedek. And this was even prophesied in the Old Testament and then fulfilled in the New Testament. And Jesus Christ today is not the beginning necessarily of this priesthood. Someone came as a representative of it and showed us a beautiful picture of it back in the Old Testament in chapter 14 and 15 of the book of Genesis. So today we're going to talk about where we left off yesterday, and that is Melchizedek and who he again shows us and what he shows us about the priesthood of the Lord Jesus Christ. And let me qualify something else too. This is in my book on Hebrews. Again, my book on Hebrews is really Paul's book on Hebrews, which is really the Holy Spirit's book on Hebrews. But this is Bob Simpson interpreting it for today's time. And you'll be blessed by it, but we're going to talk about today Melchizedek. Melchizedek was not Jesus Christ, even though people say that, well, yeah, look, it said he had no beginning and no days, no end of time. No, it's no recorded beginning of days, no recorded end of time. It just simply was he appeared on the scene and then he was gone, but he really had a birth. He really had a death. He was really a human being. And even the Bible says, behold, what a great man this was. And even brought out, he was a type of the Lord Jesus Christ. So what we ended with yesterday was Melchizedek came to Abraham and Abraham gave him tithes and gave him tithes of all the spoils he got. And again, showing, as it is in the book of Hebrews, uh, chapter seven, that Melchizedek represents Jesus Christ, and we give our tithes to the Lord Jesus Christ. We may give it here, and it said, here men that die receive tithes. That's my pastor, and the ushers that come by to receive it, or in our church, you go out, and there was a man standing there with a, with a offering basket in his hand, we place the offering in there. We give it to natural people on this earth who die, but the one that never dies is in heaven, his name is Jesus Christ, not Melchizedek. Melchizedek was a type, a picture of Jesus Christ here on this earth. And when we get to heaven, Jesus Christ is there. He's the one who receives our tithes. Understand this. You can blame your church all you want to for mis mishandling money, maybe or something, and you don't, we may not totally know. But somebody says that the point of it is I didn't give it to a human being. I gave it to Jesus Christ. He watches over it, and it's not up to me to come back and blame people for all these things. Just keep following God. Melchizedek preceded Abraham, came before him, and Abraham met him. Levi came after Abraham. In fact, he was in the loins of Abraham when Abraham gave his tithes to Melchizedek. Abraham gave to a priesthood which predated him, not to a priesthood that came after him. With no written commandments telling about the tithe, Abraham gave tithes to a priest having no pedigree, no recorded lineage, and no recorded mother or father. He was a human being, but he just suddenly, boom, appeared on the scene. And without any commandment to receive tithes, Melchizedek received tithes from Abraham. This was just something that was a picture of what we do in the New Testament. Melchizedek was the first priest mentioned in the Bible in the book of Genesis. Genesis. Other kings were mentioned in Genesis 14 in the opening verses, but Melchizedek was the only king who was also a priest, stood in two offices, which under Moses later were two different tribes. By being the only priest to come from the tribe of Judah, Jesus identified himself with Melchizedek, predating his priesthood to Abraham, Jesus skipped over Levi and resumed back at Melchizedek. In essence, what Jesus Christ did and what we're told in the book of Hebrews was Melchizedek represented a priesthood and Jesus Christ went and identified with him, not with Levi. Jesus just jumped over a thousand few years and went back to Melchizedek and said, 
said, he's the one I'm patterning myself after. Melchizedek spoke of my priesthood. Jesus is the change of the priesthood of Aaron, indicating a change in the tithe from Old Testament to New. So there is a difference in the tithe and it's brought out in the verses of scripture in the book of Hebrews. In essence, what Hebrews says is Abraham gave tithes of all and that Melchizedek received the tithes. But under the law, it says there that the tribe of Levi took tithes from the people. It was a law to give. Today, it is not a law for us to tithe, but it is taught in the New Testament as a principle that began before the law was here. But we're not under a command today that we have to where they were in the Old Testament. In fact, we don't send out ministers to homes to make sure you've given your tithes like they did in the time of the law. No, simply, we come back from our battles like Abraham did. Jesus Christ, like Melchizedek, meets us and tells us, blessed be the Lord God, who's given your enemies into your hands and given you all these blessings. And out of gratitude, we give to Jesus Christ. Here, men who die receive tithes, but there he receives it, of whom it is witnessed that he ever lives. We, like Abraham, give without a written commandment, but we give from love, not from obligation. In the New Testament, it's as a man purposes in his heart, not grudgingly or of necessity, for God loves a cheerful, cheerful giver. All right. Jesus was prophesied by David to be a change in the priesthood of Melchizedek, thus showing the need for a change in Psalm 110 verse 4. What in essence was Jesus was the change in the priesthood. Melchizedek stood for that change in the priesthood and the dispensation of grace was prophesied from the time of the Old Testament. All this is prophetic we've been talking about. Melchizedek meeting Abraham, Abraham giving tithes without being asked to do so out of love and gratitude is all a type of how we give in the New Testament today. We don't give because it's commanded. We give because of all that Jesus has done for us and out of a heart for love for him. And next of all, a love for people we give. We don't do it to prosper. We don't do it to all these other things that people do that somehow it's an obligation. No, thank God we do prosper, but we don't prosper because we do it. We prosper because of the attitude behind why we do it. In other words, I, I don't, I'm not blessed because I tithe. I'm, get, I'm blessed because of the motive behind my giving of the tithes, and that is a love for God and a love for people. If righteousness could have been attained under the Old Testament priesthood, there would not have been a need for a change. The reason why the change came is because Jesus Christ brought the truth and the power to accomplish the change. When Levi paid tithes to Melchizedek in the loins of Abraham, he was showing his subjection to a higher level of priesthood. When Abraham came and brought the priest uh, Melchizedek the tithes and gave it to him inside of him in his loins, yet to come was Levi. And in essence, as, as he came and presented tithes to him, showing his reverence and also so that he was beneath this priesthood. Levi also was in him giving tithes and showing he was beneath this priesthood. The highest priesthood that ever had existed was the priesthood of Melchizedek type showing of the one that was yet to come. And Melchizedek's priesthood was uh, temporary, but Jesus Christ is eternal. Jesus Christ went back and identified with a man that only had a few scriptures in the Old Testament. Melchizedek who received tithes from Levi through Abraham didn't come from the tribe of Levi. He also blessed Abraham who was giving the promise of being the lineage to produce Messiah. Messiah was the one to be the change of priesthood back into Melchizedek's order. There were thousands of priests in the line of Aaron, but only two in the order of Melchizedek, Melchizedek and the Lord Jesus Christ. A superior priesthood preceded and then followed the line of Aaron. If the priesthood changed, then the law must also change, and thank God it did. The law had a priesthood, but it was a temporary priesthood. The law had a priesthood of which there were many priests in there, but the one that came before him was the priesthood of Melchizedek, an individual representing an individual yet to come, whom everything would come from the Lord Jesus Christ. The inferior priesthood, thus the inferior law also, was sandwiched between two superior priests and periods of time. But just as Melchizedek did not come from Levi, neither did Jesus. Jesus came from Judah, not from Levi, and Jesus was a king first and then became a priest later, so was Melchizedek. If Melchizedek was a superior priesthood to Aaron 
and the better covenant was yet to come, someone must needs rise up after the likeness of Melchizedek, and Jesus was that one. Jesus even had something over Melchizedek. He was not born from a seed which is temporary, as was Melchizedek, but was eternal. He's a priest who never will need to be replaced. Because Melchizedek was replaced by Jesus, even his priesthood was inferior to the Lord Jesus Christ and needed to be replaced. We can now give our tithes to a high priest who remains alive and holds the office forever. That's the Lord Jesus Christ. Although the law was holy, just, and good, it was unprofitable and weak to change the nature of man. The weakness of the law was the fallen, fleshly nature of man. Why doesn't the law work in Bob? It's because I'm a natural, in my natural body, I'm a fallen human being and fallen human beings cannot keep a perfect law. But now there's a perfect part in me through Jesus Christ himself, who has now redeemed my spirit and given me his righteousness and made me a part of God. When I walk in the spirit, I do not fulfill the lust of the flesh and I keep the law. Because the law was weak, and not profitable. It had to be changed and replaced. The law contained righteousness, but man could not fulfill it to gain its righteousness because he was spiritually dead. Only through Jesus can a man be made righteous through faith and then fulfill the righteousness which is in the law. It takes Jesus Christ to give me righteousness. It takes the word and the power of the Holy Spirit to fulfill that righteousness in me after I've been born again. The Levitical priesthood made priests without an oath of office. They were born into the priesthood. Melchizedek and Jesus were both born into the office of a king. Both were made priests by an oath of office. Jesus' oath was administered by God the Father. You are a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. All the descendants of Levi died, thus guaranteeing they could not fulfill the eternal priesthood prophesied through David. David said the Messiah, the priest who would be of the order of Melchizedek, would live and rule forever. This also excluded Melchizedek, since he was only a man. The only one who could fulfill this verse was Jesus Christ himself. Jesus' priesthood is not only eternal, it will never, ever change. Why? Because Jesus Christ is sinless, was sinless, and never knew the effects of sin. We who have known the effects of sin can have it removed by the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. I'll see you right after the break. The first Hebrew believers turned Jerusalem and the world upside down. But in 70 short years, they had become bogged down in legalism by mixing Judaism and Mosaic law with their faith. This tainted doctrine crept into the rest of the church and provoked Paul to respond with an intricate and astounding revelation of Jesus Christ. In this New Testament commentary on Hebrews, Bob Yandian employs historic biblical detail and subtleties in the original Greek to dissect Paul's brilliant argument for the superiority of Jesus Christ, the mature believer's walk, the reality of authority, and the importance of faith. To order this New Testament commentary on Hebrews, visit our website at bobyandian.com. Understanding the end times, one of the most incredible and fascinating doctrines in the Word of God, will bring us comfort for the days in which we live. The Bible says we are to encourage and exhort one another with the knowledge of Jesus returning for His saints. In Understanding the End Times, Pastor Bob Yandian provides a thorough and exciting study to give you more revelation of these times in which we live. Topics include the seven dispensations, the dispensation of the mystery, the rapture of the church, the judgment seat of Christ, Daniel's 70 weeks, the temple discourse, the tribulation, the second coming, the Millennial Reign of the Lord Jesus Christ. To order Understanding the End Times, visit bobyandian.com. Bob Yandian Ministries is training up a new generation in the Word of God. Because of your generosity and faithfulness, this teaching ministry is able to change countless lives. You will never know until you get to heaven how many people received Jesus. 
were filled with the Holy Spirit, healed or found God's will for their life through your support and prayers. If you would like to become a partner with Bob Yandian, visit our website at bobyandian.com and click on Partnership. I know the things I'm teaching sound quite a bit complicated, but here's the point of it. So is the book of Hebrews. This is exactly what it's like, but breaking it down, helping you to understand it, what I'm teaching today in the book is going to be broken down for you to help you understand it and you have time to meditate on it. I've just got a list of things here I want to go through, but simply just to hit these points one after another so you can begin to understand something, the importance of the new covenant we're in today as opposed to the law, but literally picking up with a man who's seen mysterious in the Old Testament was a walking, talking example of our great high priest, the Lord Jesus Christ. The law put infirmed and imperfect men into office. Jesus Christ put it into all of that. He cleanses us. He makes us perfect before him so that we can stand in the office of a priest, Jesus Christ being our great high priest. The beauty of it is, is as a sinner, when I come before Jesus Christ, I'm coming before the great high priest, who then as I'm saved makes me a priest. And from that time on as a priest, I don't have to go to an earthly person to confess my sins as some denominations and some groups teach. No, I simply come as a priest before my great high priest. If I confess my sins, he's faithful and just to forgive me and cleanse me from all unrighteousness. So we find out there that as a sinner, I come to Jesus Christ, but also as a believer, I can come to Jesus Christ as my great high priest. Let's go back to the Old Testament one more time, Genesis chapter 14, and let's consider and take up where we left off the first time. Genesis chapter 14, here we find now to ver- through verse 20, after Melchizedek met Abraham, the king of Sodom came to him. And notice the king of the Melchizedek came to him and told him how blessed he was, how God had done all this for him. And so he gave tithes of all to him. And then now the king of Sodom comes and appeals to the lusts and the flesh of Abraham. And the king of Sodom went out to meet him after he returned from the slaughter of Keterlaomer and of the kings that were with him at the valley of Sheva, which is the king's dell. And when he came to him, what he asked him to do was he said, why don't you just keep the money and give me the people? Well, what he was saying was basically that put money above people. And of course he wouldn't do that. And this challenge again came after what Melchizedek said, look at verse 18, and Melchizedek king of Salem brought forth bread and wine and he was the priest of the most high God. And he blessed him and said, blessed be Abram of the most high God, possessor of heaven and earth and blessed be the most high God who's delivered your enemies into your hand. And he, Abraham gave to Melchizedek tithes of everything. Melchizedek was a king of a city, Jerusalem, but he was the priest of God. You and I are kings and priests down here in this earth and will be when we get to heaven. But I want you to notice this, we're gonna have a whole lot more to rule over in eternity than we do down here on earth. Again, Melchizedek was the king of a city and that was Jerusalem, but he was the priest of the most high God. I think something interesting here is, this is the first mention of the city of Jerusalem, but I want you to notice it was already in existence. It's called the eternal city. Jerusalem will never have an end. It will always be. It's always been here. It's gone through times when, you know, the Jews weren't there. Other nations came through, trod it down, did everything to it. It's still there. And when Jesus Christ comes back, it's going to exist again with a temple and Satan's going to try to rule there through Antichrist. But guess what? Jesus will come back and destroy all that. And Jesus will sit on the throne as it was prophesied in the Old Testament and it'll be there forever. Jerusalem will be here through the tribulation, through the millennial reign of Jesus Christ. And then when the millennium's over and the earth is basically the surface of us destroyed and rebuilt again, heaven will come down and rule over the earth and heaven is called the new Jerusalem. It will always be here. So it's like the eternal city. Again, I'm sure it had a beginning, but when Melchizedek comes, Jerusalem was already here. We don't know how it started, but Melchizedek was king of a city, Jerusalem, but he was the priest of God. So he was in type, the king of the Jews. He stood before the only Jew, Abraham, but symbolically before all the Jews that were on the inside of him in his loins of Abraham. And that included also the tribe of Levi. As the priest of God, Melchizedek stood between Abraham and God. Melchizedek blessed Abraham. And 
blessed God that he came from also. Melchizedek never mentioned a return for Abraham's giving, only God's love for Abraham. Yet God did give back to Abraham. Abraham's love for God was greater than his love for himself and especially the love of money. Abraham demonstrated two types of love. He went to battle and fought for people, so he loved people. But when he came back, he also had a tremendous love for God who gave him the victory in the battle. Abraham gave to Melchizedek because he was blessed not to get blessed. Understand this? He gave to Melchizedek because of the blessings God had given him and not to get more blessings from God. Yet God did bless Abraham because he gave in grace to the God of grace. This is found in Genesis chapter 15 and verse 1, 2 Corinthians chapter 8, verses 1 and 7. Let's take some verses on the importance and the blessings attached to giving. Again, in Genesis 15, 1, we find there that the Lord said, from now on, I will be your shield and your exceeding great reward. In other words, Abraham didn't give to God so that God would be his shield and then give back to him financially, but yet God did that. You see, money represents two things. I'll be your shield and your great reward. What do people hide behind money today? It's a shield against all the stuff. If I have enough money in the bank, I can survive a lot of this other stuff. And next of all, if I have it in the right accounts, I can draw interest on it. So in essence, we as human beings look at money as, as our shield and our ever increasing supply of money, our exceeding great reward. But what the Lord said was, no, you've given your money to me and you've turned loose of a lot of this. And now you no longer, your shield doesn't look as big to you and your exceeding great reward doesn't look the same as it did before. But I will be your shield and I will be your exceeding great reward. And that's what God wants. The moment we turn loose of money, which we have confidence and all that, we might be shaking as we let go of it, but we give it to God, God says, fine, now watch what I'm gonna do for you. I'll be your shield and your exceeding great reward. The whole bottom can drop out of your economy. The whole bottom can drop out of the economy of the world, but I'll still be your shield and I will still be your exceeding great reward. In other words, if I made bread in the desert, I can do it again. God hasn't lost the recipe for manna. He can still make it for you today. Let him be your shield and let him be your exceeding great reward. Second Corinthians chapter nine and verse eight says, God is able to make all grace abound toward you. All grace means financial. In fact, 2 Corinthians chapter 8 and chapter 9 is all about money, Every those two chapters. But the motive behind giving is the main thing that's taught here, not the fact that you give money. You don't give money to be blessed. You give money because you are blessed and out of a love for God. God is able to make all grace abound toward you that you always having all sufficiency in all things, you may abound to every good work. Proverbs chapter three, verses nine and 10, another verse on the power of giving and how God blesses us back. Just as Abraham gave his finances and blessing to Melchizedek, we give to the Lord. Proverbs chapter three, verses nine and 10 says, honor the Lord with your substance. That's the goods that you have. And with the first fruits of all of your increase, that's your tithe. The first fruits right off the top, verse 10 tells us what the results will be. So shall your barns be filled with plenty and your presses will burst out with new wine. Oh, the beauty of that here found in these verses of scripture. In fact, in Proverbs 3 verses 9 and 10, go back to verses 5 through 8, and you'll find out that the attitude behind your giving is the most important thing of all, love for God and love for people. 2 Corinthians chapter 9 and verse 7 says this, every man according as he purposes in his own heart, so let him give, not grudgingly or of necessity, for God loves a cheerful giver. Notice again, God looks at the attitude of your giving, not the giving itself. We often look how big somebody's offering is, but you know what? That may be small for them compared to their total income. And yours might look small to you, but you realize it's big because it's a bigger chunk of your income. God doesn't look at the amount you give. He looks at the, the amount of uh, responsibility. God looks at the amount of giving that you do, and he looks at your heart behind it. God doesn't bless the giving. He blesses the attitude behind it. So every man, according as he purposes in his own heart, so let him give. I can't tell you how much to give. I'd love for you to become a partner with me in this ministry, but you know 
know what? I'm not going to tell you how much to give. I could give out an amount. Some of you would choke on it, say, well, it's just too much. And others would say, oh, yeah, I can give that. In other words, God asks us for equal sacrifices, not for equal amounts. And a sacrifice for you is one size a sacrifice for someone else, maybe larger or smaller. But again, every man, according as he purposes in his heart, so let him give, not grudgingly or of necessity. God loves a cheerful giver. In other words, the attitude behind it, quick to give and delights in giving. And how did Abraham give? He gave out of love toward a God that had blessed him in battle and rewarded him. And out of that love for God, he gave back to him. And how do I love God? especially giving into souls and discipleship. This ministry, first of all, we love to get people saved, but the main thing this ministry does through me is make disciples out of converts. I love doing that. To me, maturity is one of the best things to have. And again, the word of God is given to us. These exceeding great and precious promises are given to us that by them, we might be partakers of the divine nature and then accomplish God's will in this earth. God wants me to be able to do it, but I do it through the promises of God. And this is simply growing up because Becoming mature in the things of God. Hebrews 11, 4 says, By faith Abel offered to God a more acceptable sacrifice than Cain. And again, the sacrifice he offered was acceptable to God. God loved it, but Cain offered something that was satisfying to him. And it says, Through which he was commended as righteous, God commended him by accepting his gifts. And through his faith, though he died, he still speaks. Melchizedek's not here. Abel's not here. Cain slew Abel. And so Abel is in heaven. The Bible talks about the first martyr in heaven. He's up there and his blood still cries out, how long, Lord, before you compensate all these things? And the Lord is simply saying, I will do it at the right time. In the meantime, what is God asking us to do? Take a look at Cain and Abel and say, Abel gave the way God wanted him to. He might've suffered for it, but Cain did not give in the right way. The point of it is, is I wanna be able to give to God and give to God his way out of love toward him, a love toward people, People, a love toward souls, and a love toward discipleship, the things that really make the body of Christ strong and make witnessing strong in the earth. By doing that, again, we are looking at what God wants and giving his way. The motive behind the giving is I want my motive to be the same motive as Jesus Christ himself and as God the Father. I want the heart of the Father when I give. So when I give into an offering, whether it's tithes or offerings, by that offering, I realize something. Someone's gonna be born again. Someone's gonna be growing up in the things of God, and then they're gonna get other people saved. They're gonna mature other people, bring disciples along. And guess what? God's gonna be blessed and give back to me good measure, pressed down, shaken together and running over. I trust this has helped you as we've studied about Melchizedek and the Lord Jesus Christ. Don't forget again to get my book on the book of Hebrews. It'll help explain all these things. Bless you. We'll see you next time. You can order resources, become a partner, or browse free articles and podcasts by visiting our website at bobyandian.com. You can also join our mailing list and receive weekly devotions and the latest ministry updates. If you would like to contact Bob Yandian Ministries, visit bobyandian.com and click on Contact. To contact us by mail, use the address on your screen. Thank you for watching today's broadcast. We'll see you next time on Student of the Word with Bob Yandian.